So one of the other reform movements in the early 19th century, we've talked about education reform, we've talked about the religious revivals and really this movement or this awakening, this second great awakening to tell people that, hey, if you want a good life, you're in control of it. If you want good things to happen to you, you should be in charge of your own good doings. And, and it was a way to kind of influence people to do more moral good as opposed to selfish good. So doing what's right as opposed to what maybe you want to do. The temperance movement was a movement to try and get people to reduce their alcohol consumption. All right. So alcohol was considered to be the demon's rum, they called it. People believe that if you drank intoxicating liquors, then you are basically inviting evil into your life. You were uh, putting temptation into your body. And so that led to abuse and breakup of families. And sadly, we still see that today, that alcohol can be a problem for people who do not use it in moderation. Obviously, there's a legal age to where um, alcohol can be consumed, but people 21 and older, there are some who have not proven to be responsible with it. And those people sometimes can get themselves into trouble. It can impair your vision. It can impair your judgment. It can impair your line of thinking, which if you get behind a motor vehicle, that can cause um, some great damage and that can put people in jail. That can also cause people to lose lives. Um, people who abuse anything and don't get the proper help for it, that sometimes can alienate them from their friends, from their families. And so a lot of people in the early 19th century started noticing that more and more problems were um, occurring, crime was increasing, and they kind of pointed the finger at alcohol. So the temperance people were trying to tell people, you don't have to necessarily cut it out altogether. Some people should, but what they were trying to say is if you do it in moderation, just like anything in life, if you do things in moderation or you limit how much of something that you have, then it's okay. I mean, think about like um, soda, pop, Coke, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you drink those things, which are not really healthy for you, but if you drink them in moderation, you don't drink them every day and have three cans of pop a day, then you'll be okay. Fast food, if you have McDonald's maybe once a week, it's not going to be the end of the world, okay? But somebody who will eat fast food and greasy, uh, you know, unhealthy foods and all three meals every day, that's not temperance. That's, that's kind of going in excess and, and that's, that's not good. So temperance is really just getting people to limit the things that might be potentially uh, harmful for their bodies. So fast forward to um, 1919, the passing of the 18th Amendment, which was really the height of the temperance movement. So we're talking in the 1820s, 1830s, about a century later, Congress finally amended the Constitution to make alcohol illegal. So you couldn't own it, you couldn't drink it, you couldn't sell it. But what they saw was that problems actually increased when it was illegal because people were still finding a way to get it illegally and smuggling it. But for a brief period of time, the temperance reformers got what they wanted, where the law stepped up and said, okay, we're going to start to penalize people who um, overuse it. And at one point, it was illegal to even have, all right? So then later, the 21st Amendment repealed prohibition, or it repealed the 18th Amendment and said, okay, we're, we're going to allow people to have it now, but we're going to set an age where you can have it and consume it, okay? So... Anybody who's under the age of 21, whether they have consumed it or not, if it's in their possession, they can get a citation. They can get a, a ticket for that, um, especially if they're driving a motor vehicle. Some people have lost their licenses because they have um, had um, these substances that they shouldn't have, or they have them in a, in a uh, position where they, uh, they shouldn't have it. Now, along with temperance reform, so... Temperance was the idea that we're going to limit the evils in people's lives. Well, another uh, potential evil that some people saw was mental illness, okay? And it used to be that the belief was um, certain people were either born mentally ill or they weren't born mentally ill. But as we've learned, as we look at it in 2021, we know that experiences in people's lives can contribute to mental uh, health issues, right? So if you have a traumatic experience or um, some sort of bad encounter, that can lead to mental health uh, issues. 
And at the time in the 1820s, prisoners were being locked up, they were being shackled, they were put in poor conditions, okay? Um, and so a woman named Dorothea Dix looked at the way that prisoners and um, those who were deemed mentally ill were being treated. And they were being treated as though they weren't human beings. They were being treated as outcasts in society. Now, I know some people are like, well, that's the way that enslaved people were treated as well. And so you're right. The point in this and the point in this connection is that once people like Dorothy Dick started saying that, well, we need to treat um, prisoners and um, those in mental health institutions, people need to be treating them better. That got more people to realize, okay, if we're going to bring attention to this, then we certainly should bring attention to the institution of slavery and abolitionists jumped on board and said, yeah, this is what we've been preaching. We've been preaching that nobody should be locked up and shackled. Nobody should be treated like an animal, um, especially if it's something that is not of their doing. Okay. So um, keep in mind that not every criminal, not every person who is institutionalized or locked up is necessarily a bad person. They're not always guilty of some of those crimes either. So the primary goal of mental health reform was to recognize mental health issues that could be fixed and to let people know that um, a prisoner or uh, someone with mental health issues is not doomed. Because at that time, some people just believe that if you're a criminal, if you, if you do one thing wrong, then you're basically deemed a bad person and, and there's no saving you. Dorothea Dix and other reformers were trying to say that no, people can be reformed, people can be saved, people can turn around their lives, people can be helped if they want to be helped. And so those with mental health conditions needed rehabilitation and not punishment. Because again, if you were to look at a prison and if you were to look at a mental health uh, institution, there wasn't much difference. It was hard to tell which was which because uh, people in both areas were being treated poorly in the same way, much like enslaved peoples were also being uh, mistreated. So prison conditions were similar to the mistreatment of enslaved peoples. And again, that helped bring even more light to the abolitionist movement in the 19th century. 